History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno. This is lecture 14? 14, yeah, lecture 14. The History of Nature 2, January 7th, 1965. Ladies and gentlemen, you will recollect that last time we discussed the concept of natural history and had arrived at the notion of a second nature and its ambiguous meaning. I should like now simply to continue with my reflections on the ideas we have now established in connection with the Hegelian concept of a second nature. This, you will remember, was the spiritual, the spiritual that forms the substance and the definition of freedom. It is embodied in the legal system on which Hegel then confers the title of second nature. To the best of my knowledge, this concept was taken up again for the first time, and in a very emphatic way, in George Lucas's theory of the novel. Taken as a set of reflections on art, as aesthetic meditations, this is a highly problematic book, but it retains its fundamental importance as one of the first attempts at an objectivist philosophy of history, instead of a merely subjectivist one. I should like to encourage all of you to read it now, now that it has been reprinted, even though the preface contains an attack on me. However, I do not wish to address his criticisms because what Lucas says there has nothing in common with the quality of the work, and so I would like to believe nothing in common with the quality of my own work. The concept of a second nature remains the negation of whatever might be thought of as a first nature, so it does not represent the recurrence of a nature that has been suppressed and is now being restored. But on the contrary, it is the totality of whatever has been so completely trapped by social and rational mechanisms, the two cannot be distinguished, that nothing differing from it can manifest itself. And because there is nothing else outside it, it requires the appearance of the natural, in other words, of what simply exists and is given. There is not even the possibility of something outside it becoming visible, something that is not caught up in the general inclusiveness. The exclusion of possibility which converts the second nature into the only reality is what also turns it into the substitute for possibility, and it is in this way that the semblance of the natural comes into being. Thus, whatever is a thesi, if I may use this terminology, that is, whatever is posited, albeit not produced by individuals, as Hegel and Marx taught, but brought about as both recognized by its impersonal context, usurps the insignia of everything that appears to the bourgeois consciousness to be nature and natural. You can picture this to yourselves quite easily by reflecting on the fact that in the unthinking language of every day, a language I had always rather disliked, a man is thought to speak naturally if he speaks like everyone else. That is to say, if he is a man who conforms to general linguistic conventions. In contrast, a man who does not speak like that, who insists on the individual aspects of his own personality, can easily gain a reputation for affectation and artificiality. I think that what people irresponsibly mean by natural person is a prime example of this concept of second nature, and you can all see what is meant by it without my having to pursue this discussion any further. The more relentlessly the process of societalization spins its web around every aspect of immediate human and interpersonal relations, the more impossible it becomes to recollect the historical origins of that process, and the more irresistible the external semblance of something natural. Nothing that is outside appears to me to be outside. There is even a sense in which it has ceased to be what is outside. Thanks to the total mediation that transforms even the elements of nature into elements of the second nature. And so to return to my argument, if you think of the role played by nature today in the ordinary sense of nature in a landscape as, a con as contrasted with our urban industrial civilization, you will realize that this nature is already something planned, cultivated and organized. It is gradually turning into a nature reserve if I may exaggerate somewhat, and as the director of the Frankfurt Zoo has frequently pointed out, it is already becoming a problem literally to protect the natural space that wild animals need if they are to be able to move around freely. In this sense, then, 
and I intend this only by way of explanation. I am sure that you are all aware that when I talk about a second nature, I am not referring literally to the nature of a nature reserve. In this sense, we can see that what seems to be outside us is in reality not outside at all, but something that has been captured. This semblance of the natural is a function of the gap between the history of mankind and primary nature. And by primary nature, I say this so that you should not pick me up on this and say, you see, even Adorno has forgotten about the dialectic here. By primary nature, I mean in the first instance, no more than the elements, the objective elements that the experiencing consciousness encounters without his experiencing them as, some, as things he has himself mediated. Semblance is the prophetic warning of an increasingly powerful spell. On this point, I should like to read you a passage from Marx, from his early writings, in fact, from the German ideology. We know only a single science, the science of history. One can look at history from two sides and divide it into the history of nature and the history of men. The two sides are, however, inseparable. The history of nature and the history of men are dependent on each other so long as men exist. So here you have this insight into the reciprocal mediation of these two so-called spheres. But in contrast to Hegel, about whom I spoke in this connection last time, this mediation does not take place externally in the sense that history becomes a special realm built up on nature. But rather, as Marx suggests, the history of nature and the history of men mutually condition each other as long as men exist. But if you will allow me to extract a further conclusion from this, and teasing out the implications of this reciprocal mediation of nature and history constitutes the substance of the philosophy of the young Marx, I should like to add that, of course, there can no longer be any point in talking about an insulated sphere of nature as the absolute realm of being or as existence as opposed to history. Marx is in no doubt that, if we are to speak of priorities here, then precedence is to be given to society, to the historical sphere. But there too, we should not let ourselves be tempted to ontologize. We should not argue, as has been imputed to me, wrongly, I believe, that this means that in the beginning there was society which then created heaven and earth. For society itself is determined by the things of which it is composed, and it therefore necessarily contains a non-social dimension. Critical dialectical thought should repudiate the idea that these two concepts, history and philosophy, are isolated, entirely detachable strata. The traditional antithesis of nature and history is both true and false. It is true when it expresses what happens to nature. It is false when it simply reinforces conceptually, his, conceptually history's own concealment of its own natural growth. The distinction between nature and history is an unthinking expression of the division of labor that has directly projected the inevitable differences between scientific methods onto the objects of their study. The ahistorical concept of history that is cultivated in the resurrected metaphysics of Martin, of Martin Heidegger, above all in what it has called historicity, would serve to demonstrate the complicity of ontological thought with naturalistic thought, from which the former had so eagerly sought to distance itself. If history becomes the basic ontological structure of existence, or indeed a kind of qualitas occulta, a hidden quality of existence that is supposed to be essentially historical simply because of its temporal horizon, then history will be mutation as immutability, and thus the imitation of a natural religion from which there is no escape. For there too there is eternal change, just think of the seasons, which constantly repeat itself and thus congeals into a constant factor. Thus, to locate the concept of history in existence amounts paradoxically to an ontological inflation that does away with the concept of history by a sort of conjuring trick. Something similar happened in ancient times in the case of Hegel's favorite Heraclitus. While traditional historians of philosophy have always regarded the Iliadic philosophers, that is to say the philosophers of being, as the polar opposite of Heraclitus, the philosopher of absolute becoming, modern classical philolog philology <laughs> has not been mistaken in its insistence that this distinction is not absolute, 
and that the two extremes meet and merge. This ontologization of history makes it possible to transpose determinate historical processes at will into constant factors. The effect of this is to give a philo philosophical, philosophical cachet to the vulgar notion that historical conditions, which once upon a time were thought to be the expression of God's will, are now to be regarded as natural. This is one of the ways in which existing reality can be justified as essential. The ontologists claim that we have now moved beyond the divergence of nature and history, and history does not hold water. The historicity abstracted from actual historical processes passes unscathed the thorn that bears the true guilt for the antithesis of nature and history, which itself ought not to be ontologized. In this respect, too, the new ontology is a crypto-idealism. It relates the non-identical to identity, and by postulating the concept of historicity as the agent of history, it does away with everything that resists the process of identification by an all-dominant consciousness. We might point out, however, that ontology is driven to ideology, to reconciliation in the mind, because no reconciliation was achieved in reality. Historical contingency and the concept are at odds with each other, all the more inexorably, the more they are intertwined. We might speak in this context of contingency, chance as the historical fate of the individual, a fate that is meaningless because the historical process itself has no global subject and therefore presents itself as contingent and meaningless in this highest sense, in which meaning stands opposed to the contingent. What nature actually is, is not just obscured by the totality of what is thesi, or thesi, or thesi what is posited, but the question of nature as the absolute first immediate thing, as opposed to its mediations, represents the object of its search in the hierarchical form of an analytical proposition whose premises control everything that follows from them, but they do so according to the pattern established by what has been postulated. Thus, what exists from the outset becomes a function of what is posited, and in particular the semblance of something that exists in itself, that is natural, non-posited, an absolute first thing, turns out to be a function of the act of positing, things to which this non posited thing is unmasked as its opposite, as something that has been made. Through a sleight of hand, whatever is thesi is converted by history, which gave it birth, into physis, into nature, and in fact, into second nature. Once the distinction has been postulated, it can be made more fluid by reflection, but cannot be ignored. Without reflection, admittedly, the distinction would render harmless the quintessence of the contents of the historical process demoting it to the status of mere ornament, and on the other hand, it would enthrone as essence whatever has not yet come into existence. Accordingly, mind would see all nature, and whatever claims to be nature, installed as history, and all history is nature. That, then, is the program, if I may call it that, that philosophy would have to postulate for the relation of nature to history, if I may repeat myself here, because I believe that this program is constitutive for all attempts to interpret the philosophy of history, or indeed philosophy in general, I think that the, the attempt should be made to behold nature, and whatever regards itself as nature, is history. Hegel would call it something that has become, or has been mediated. Conversely, however, everything historical has to be regarded as nature, because thanks to its own violent origins, it remains under the spell of blind nature from which it struggles to dissociate itself. I may perhaps here cite a passage from a lecture that I gave here to the Kant Society. This was over 30 years ago in 1932, but in its broad outlines it has retained its validity. The task of philosophy should be to comprehend historical existence in its extreme historical determinacy, at the point where it is at its most historical, as itself a natural form of existence or to conceive of nature as historical existence, precisely where it is at its most natural. End of quotation. The point at which nature and history meet is in the fact of transience. Walter Benjamin acknowledged the truth of this in a prominent place in the origin of German tragic drama, and in general this book goes far beyond the sphere of purely aesthetic questions. In this sense, it belongs in the same tradition as Lucas's book on the theory of the novel, 
which I mentioned to you earlier on, through the medium of aesthetics, questions concerning the philosophy of history and even metaphysics become legible. It would be worth dwelling on these matters, and, per and perhaps I shall at some point find time to explore the fact that for a whole series of thinkers, the experience of art has become a sort of key to other branches of philosophy. <clears throat> this is something I am very conscious of. We are not speaki speaking here of a naive attempt to aestheticize philosophy, as Helmut Kuhn once accused me of doing. What is at issue, rather, is a particular relation to the experience of structures that purport to be meaningful, and that provide a model both of meaning that can be explored and of the crisis of meaning. In this context, for those of you who are interested in this aspect of things, I would, ref I would refer you to passages that I inserted into the jargon of authenticity in the course of my attack on Martin Heidegger. These were passages warning against the devaluation of so-called cultural philosophy and about the relationship between philosophy and so-called cultural philosophy. At any rate, to come back to Benjamin, here's the sentence that seems to me to provide a key, not just to the origin of German tragic drama, but to this entire philosophy. The poets of the Baroque age had a vision of nature as eternal transients, and here alone did the Saturnine vision of this general of this generation recognize history. Not only their vision, however, for even today the history of nature still remains the canon for the interpretation of the philosophy of history. I quote Benjamin once more a few pages earlier in the same book. When, as is the case in the Trauer Spiel, history becomes part of the setting, it does so as script. The word history stands written on the countenance of nature and the characters of transients. Here, too, would be the place to consider such matters as the decoding of one of the primeval one of the primeval allegories, that of the death's head. But perhaps I shall be able to say something to you about that at some point in the future. But I would also remind you of the most ancient instance of an allegorical and hermeneutic writing from the theological tradition of monotheism, namely the mean, mean, tekel, Uparsin. Benjamin goes on to say that the allegorical physiognom physiognomy of the nature history, which is put on stage in the Trauerspiel, is present in reality in the form of the ruin. You can see how in such motifs, motifs as the ruin mentioned here, or the death's head, or the writing on the wall, the transition to concreteness is adumbrated that I think of as something that philosophy must implement in all seriousness. It differs from the usual philosophizing about the concrete and that the concrete references here are apprehended allegorically in their specific meaning instead of serving as examples or paradigms for more general concepts whose validity they are supposed to demonstrate. This is how the concrete appears in an older generation of philosophers such as Simmel. I believe that this is a truly pivotal turn to a relevant philosophy, but one which has not yet been taken by philosophical theory, or, better perhaps, by epistemological theory to the requisite degree. However, it is one which my own modest efforts are striving to promote, which you will discover in this program, and this is connected with that special notion of concreteness, is the transmutation of metaphysics into history. It secularizes metaphysics into the ultimate category of secularity, that of decay. Philosophy interprets its code at the micro level and the shards that result from decay and that are the bearers of objective meanings. No recollection of tran transcendence is possible any longer unless, it's, unless it passes through transience in the spirit of the heretical speculation that makes the life of the absolute as dependent upon the, f the finite as the finite is dependent upon that of the absolute. Those of you who know their Hegel will be aware of his thesis that the absolute and infinite are arrived at by passing through the dialectic of the finite. Thus, Hegel himself is not as remote from this half-mystical, half-heretical speculation as the official tenor of his philosophy might suggest. We may have greater hope of finding metaphysics in the realm of the finite. If for once I may speak plainly and even bluntly, than in the abstract sphere of eternity with its vain efforts to shuffle off the coils of transience. 
And the task of traditional philosophy today is precisely to justify this philosophical turn against its traditional meaning. <coughs> Eternity no longer appears as such, but only as refracted through the most ephemeral of things. At the point where the Hegelian metaphysics equates the life of the absolute with the totality of the transience of all things finite, it rises above the mythic spell which it absorbs and reinforces. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is what I wanted to say to you about the history of nature. I should like to use the remaining minutes to draw some inferences from what I have been saying with reference to the conception of philosophy, about which I have already told you in connection with these ideas. There are motifs that have such deep roots in the historical process, in what used to be called the spirit of the age, that a certain common theme constantly reasserts itself beyond even extreme differences of opinion. An instance of such a common theme is the idea of philosophy as interpretation or hermeneutics, as it is called in the school of Martin Heidegger, following on from Wilhelm Dilthey. This theme has, of course, become established academically and has merged with an old-style first philosophy. This is not the place to explain to you the reasons for this transition from philosophical thought to hermeneutics. Nevertheless, I believe that in my remarks on natural history, I have to some extent given you an example of this transition and, as it were, demonstrated it to you experimentally. Even so, I believe that it is the task of a lecture course such as this to accomplish this transition, this philosophical turn, and not simply to assume dogmatically that this has already been done. I should like at least to mention a few of the relevant motifs here by way of explaining to you why philosophy has been forced into this change, and this I repeat despite its otherwise mutually incompatible tendencies. One such motif is the pervasive insight into the increasingly problematic nature of philosophical systems, a motif that is not the monopoly of any one school. But this I mean the impossibility of, or by this I mean the impossibility of deducing all phenomena from a single unified principle, or interpreting them all on that basis. If the light of philosophy can no longer be kindled by a single thought or motif or unified method, we may ask whether a unified method has ever really succeeded in shedding much light on anything, and if, on the other hand, philosophy insists on attempting to shed light in this way, and does not confine itself to issuing guidelines for the sciences, this will lead more or less inevitably to its looking for this light in the individual phenomena, the disiecta membra, remaining from the different systems. If you cast your minds back to those quotations from Benjamin about transience and decay, you will, re you will recollect that they should be understood as pointing to the fact that interpretation presupposes the decay of systems. Moreover, inasmuch as those systems contained any truth, that truth has now, if it has not evaporated entirely, retreated into the details, into the individual parts of the system, and now forms the object of study of interpretation, or, God help us, hermeneutics. From fidelity to philosophy, the insistence upon the philosophical impulse, despite the demise of the system, together with the statement handed down from one philosopher to the next, that philosophy is only possible as a system, all that can no longer be sustained in the face of the needs of philosophy. This does not mean that, by sacrificing the overall principle that it should organize the totality of all phenomena, philosophy should also abandon intellect as such. On the contrary, the more we see the erosion of the constitutive character of mind that used to find expression in philosophical systems, the more insistent becomes the need not just to register existing reality, but to reflect upon it and understand it. And it is this that refers us in our search for a philosophical knowledge of individual things to the only source of knowledge that remains, given the present trend towards dispersion and fragmentation, namely towards interpretation, the art of deciphering. Finally, I should add something about what my own experience tells me is an almost overwhelming need for interpretation. This is the part played by the fact that the avenues that might lead to a practice that could bring about change are all blocked. The effect this has is to ensure that all the energies that were formerly concentrated in attempts to bring about a novel, sta a novel state of affairs 
now flow into the process of interpretation. I am familiar with the argument that interpretation is merely a surrogate, a way of fobbing people off. I have nothing with which to counter this objection, except for a recurrent idea of Marx's to the effect that it is not open to any way of thinking arbitrarily to escape from the historical situation in which it finds itself. If thought finds itself locked into a situation in which practice is blocked, so that interpretation is the only activity left open to it, it would be an illusion and pure self-deception for philosophy to react otherwise. That would be a sort of justification of Alexandrianism, of which I am sure I am as well aware as any of you. The problem here, however, lies not so much with thinking itself as with the relation to the objective situation in which thought finds itself. Nowadays, at any rate, the joy of thinking lies in interpretation. The conception of interpretation, the sudden moment of insight, is what everyone hopes for when he philosophizes today, seriously philosophizes, as opposed to studying philosophy. Anyone who is unwilling to undertake this, who has never experienced the pleasure of interpretation personally, should leave philosophy alone. At any rate, the only philosophy that seems to be possible today I would say that interpretation <coughs> I would say that interpretation is the only thing that could inspire people to do philosophy today. With this shrinking of trust in theoretical system building, it may be that the need to philosophize has effectively focused entirely on interpretation. After all, the only thing that inspires philosophers of all shades of opinion and I consciously ignore the differences separating thinkers in the world today, is contained in the gesture. What does it all mean? Is what we see really all that there is? Is there nothing more to it than this? What makes this question objectively so irresistible? This, is that really all there is? Isn't there any more to it than this? Is this complete state of shutdown in which we find ourselves? We might say that the function of such questions as is that all there is or what does it all mean is that of an absence in the same way the majority of the concepts that have resonance in philosophy today exert a fascination precisely because those other concepts are missing their underlying substance is absent thus the widespread preoccupation with the metaphysics of time arises from the circumstance that our consciousness of time itself has gone into crisis time has ceased to be something we can take for granted It is no longer substantial, and this explains why our minds seek literally to rediscover time, as the title of the greatest novel of the century suggests. Enrico Castelli, the Italian philosopher, has written a fascinating book about the way in which the metaphysics of time is built on the loss of time. Unfortunately, his book has remained largely unknown in Germany. The emptier of meaning existing reality appears today. The greater the pressure or the desire to interpret it, and to have done with this meaninglessness. The light that is kindled in the phenomena as they fragment, disintegrate, and fly apart is the only source of hope that can set philosophy alight. For philosophy, as I have been suggesting in these lectures, is the Stygian darkness that sets out to unveil meaning. It would be much more important to explain this idea than to obey the, obey the impulse to deduce or to take philosophical possession of the totality All that has now ceased to be philosophy. Instead, we have the immersion in the individual detail, that unreserved immersion in the individual. Specific detail that Hegel called for, but that he also repudiated in his actual intellectual practice. Heidegger comes very close to the idea of interpretation, but it is corrupted, so it appears to me, because it is committed to the distinction between the ontic and the ontological, while the ontological structure turns out to be something other than what we might truly think of as meaning. At bottom, it is nothing more than the multiplicity of universal concepts to which specific phenomena are to be adapted. And it is this process of adapting that philosophical interpretation is supposed to transcend, that, to put it dogmatically, is what distinguishes the art of interpreting the signs of the philosophy of history from the hermeneutics fashionable today. I should like to continue next time from the point we have now reached and then conclude what I have to say about the philosophy of history by giving you an even larger backdrop 
relating to one of its most central categories, one in which all our previous discussions can be said to culminate, and that is the concept of progress.